welcome to Dielectric Videos. Now as you can see, I have a big bundle of wires and components on a breadboard and this mysterious looking thing on a plate and transformers and all this. So what exactly did I build here? Well, this is my very first ever tube amplifier. And if you're in the United Kingdom, you might refer to this as a valve amplifier. Now this is essentially the same as any amplifier you'd find to drive a big speaker system like in your home theater, except this, rather than using transistors like most modern amplifiers do, uses a technology much, much older, the vacuum tube. Now, the more uh, specifics of how a vacuum tube works, uh, I won't really get into in this video, but I'll give you a very brief overview. Uh, basically, this tube or valve, as it's also called, is essentially an evacuated glass container. And inside this glass container is a cathode like this uh, with a coil of wire very close to it called the filament. Now a low voltage is put across the filament and causes it to glow red hot. And that heats up this cathode, which is generally connected to a negatively charged source. Now, if we recall from my video on electricity basics, a negatively charged source has a bunch of extra electrons in it just waiting to do something. And when you get this cathode super hot, these electrons start firing off in all directions. Now, if you go to the other side of the tube and you put a big giant collecting uh, device called a plate here, or an anode, some of these electrons are going to run into it. And if you put a positive charge on this, uh, on this anode, meaning there's a bunch of missing spots for electrons, the electrons are really gonna wanna jump to it. And that's going to allow current to flow, well, Technically, conventional current would flow in this direction, but that's going to allow current to flow through the tube and to do work. For example, drive a speaker or a transformer or do any number of tasks. But this isn't all that useful because if you just have a cathode and an anode, the current's always going to flow in one direction, or is always going to flow in one direction. Uh, and it's really, all this is going to do is effectively provide a one-way check valve. It won't do much else. This thing here is what you'd call a diode in terms of uh, tube technology. And it's just like a silicon diode or a germanium diode. Now, this becomes a bit more useful if you stick a plate, or not a plate, a screen in between. And they generally refer to these screens as grids. If, it's, if there's two of them, there'll be a grid and a screen. And if there's three of them, there'll be a grid, a screen, and a suppressor. Now, this is an example of a triode. A triode, of course, being three different electrodes. And the th uh, third one here is called the grid. Now, the grid, if it is connected to a very negative source, then it's going to block all these electrons. The electrons are going to go towards the grid, and they're going to turn around and head back because they don't, want, uh, they don't want to see their own kind. If there's already a bunch of negative electrons here, nothing is going to happen. However, if the grid is less negative or even positive, that's going to pull these electrons through it. And that's going to make lots of them not only run into the grid, but go through it and hit this, uh, the plate. Now, if this happens, lots of current is going to flow. Now, if lots of current is flowing, the device can be considered in the on state or the conducting state. Now, one of the cool things about this is in a well-implemented vacuum tube, the actual amount of current that's going to flow into, the, uh, into this grid is very, very, very small. And that effectively makes this the equivalent of a field effect transistor. Now it's not a transistor because it doesn't use uh, a semiconductor, but it uses the same principle of having a charged high voltage affecting, or a charged voltage affecting the flow of current through the device, as opposed to the flow of current, like in a bipolar junction transistor, affecting the amount of current going from the base, or going from the collector to the emitter. So, this is all great, but sometimes uh, you want to be able to more finely control the flow of electrons through the tube. So, you can put in more grids. Now, if you have a second grid, they call that the screen. And effectively, that allows you to finely adjust the amount of power that the tube is going to output by biasing the screen up and down. The third one is called the suppressor, and if you have three, it's called a pentode. Two, uh, two grids would be called a tetrode, but the most common types of tubes are triodes and pentodes. Now generally in a pentode, the suppressor, which is the third grid, is directly tied to the, uh, to the cathode. 
That's just part of the construction, and I won't go into the specifics on why that is today. Now I'm using a pentode in my amplifier because it has very high power and can be uh, tuned to have either high gain with relatively small headroom or low gain with relatively high headroom. And right now I have a, a very high gain with low headroom, but still enough to actually make a reasonably good audio signal. Since I haven't pre-amplified it, I have to have that high gain. I'm only using a passive transformer to boost the output from my computer into the voltage that is needed to drive the tube. Now I'll get into this uh, circuit and how it works right now. So as you can see in this box of wires, probably the first and most obvious uh, device is the tube. The tube here, it's a 6DQ6B uh, vacuum tube pentode. This is actually designed to be the uh, vertical deflection uh, driver in an old CRT television, but I've repurposed it to be used as an audio amplifier. And it is this big element here. Uh, th this is the symbol for a pentode. You have the plate, the, uh, you have the plate, the cathode, the suppressor, the screen, and the grid, as well as the filament down here. And the next thing you'll probably notice is this big transformer over here. This transformer corresponds to this part of the circuit, which is what turns the 120 volt mains, since I'm in the United States, up into 240 volt mains, or 240 volt AC supply. That's then sent through a silicon bridge rectifier, or uh, probably a Schottky bridge rectifier specifically, which is then sent through a 4 ohm uh, resistor to stabilize this filter capacitor, which takes the ripple out of the DC output. Now, as you recall, the uh, peak to peak uh, vo voltage of the AC mains will actually be the square root of two times the RMS voltage. But since I only have a 40 microfarad capacitor and a fairly large load, as well as some loss in the transformer, I've measured my B plus output to be roughly about 300 volts, usually slightly less, around 280 most of the time. And that just so happens to be a very good voltage for operating these tubes. They have to run at very high voltage because there has to be a great enough potential between the cathode and the plate to actually get the electrons to jump across and make, uh, make the tube work. Now the way I've actually set this up is I've biased the tube so that the screen is biased at 95 volts. I've used a voltage divider here with a 47K resistor and a 20K resistor, and this voltage will actually sink down a little bit below 95 volts because some of it goes into the tube uh, and beca because the tube is negatively charged at the screen. Now in order to make this a class A amplifier, which is the type that it is, I've biased up the cathode by putting a 100 ohm resistor with a capacitor to, uh, to allow any AC signals to short to ground, and this allows the tube to essentially operate in a continuous linear mode, meaning it's always slightly turned on, well actually, it's always turned on roughly 50%, and any audio signal is gonna either turn it on more or turn it off. And the advantage of a Class A amplifier is it's very low distortion. You don't have a whole lot of clipping on the bottom or top when it first starts the signal. Now it can clip if you reach the uh, end of your headroom, meaning that if you overdrive it and saturate it, or underdrive it, bringing it all the way down to zero, and you actually turn the tube off completely. Now the grid is what actually does the switching, and the grid I have connected with a 1K resistor to bias it to ground in the DC domain. That way this uh, cathode is slightly above the grid, and thus the grid is seen by the tube as being negative. This, capacitor, this 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor located uh, right here, or actually right here, is then taking the grid and uh, allowing AC signals into it from the audio source without backfeeding any voltage into the audio source. And then I, the, all these resistors and uh, this ceramic cap here and this other electrolytic capa capacitor you see here are serving as frequency response adjustments. I found that when I first started out with this project, it was extremely tinny and high frequency, so I attenuated some of the high frequencies. Now, because this is not a pre-amplified tube, I'm still having trouble getting enough power into it to get those low frequency responses. And another thing you'll notice is because this is a 300 volt plate voltage, I need to use a transformer uh, to actually step it down to the voltage that the speaker wants. You can see on the back here, I have an audio transformer configured to do that. But what that also means is if this transformer saturates, you're going to then lose some of the fidelity in it and that's especially true on low frequency signals, which require a very big sweep 
to make things happen. So I have my audio input uh, from the computer driven through a 20 to 1 power transformer that I repurposed essentially to take this low, low voltage and jump it up to a slightly higher voltage that drives the grid a little bit more effectively. I have the grid biased with quite high gain by setting this voltage much lower than the 300 volt B plus voltage uh, at the screen. And then I have the entire circuit set up to operate with the speaker load run through an audio transformer. Of course, also the uh, filament, which is this glowing orange you can see in the tube, is being run off just a 6.3 volt transformer, which is not quite in shot. You might be able to see it over here, but that's just keeping the filament hot to allow those electrons to boil off of the cathode and strike the plate. So now that you've seen me uh, point out all the different parts and how I built this thing, uh, I'm going to pro uh, go and play some music now. Before I play music though, I would like to identify one uh, safety precaution for anyone trying this out. You can see I have it set on a non-conductive cardboard container, which is probably actually not the best choice since it is somewhat flammable. However, all the high voltage components I have isolated, and on top of that, this entire circuit is protected behind my isolation transformer, which you can see in another video. That way, if I accidentally touch any component of it, uh, it doesn't uh, directly shock me through the earth-grounded uh, floor. However, the real danger here is if you, had any, if you had two fingers touching any part at the same time, a very large amount of current could flow through your body and potentially cause uh, severe shock or even kill you. So it's incredibly important that you only use one hand at a time when it's operating, and it's especially important after you've unplugged it to discharge any capacitors. You see this old electrolytic capacitor that I'm using, it's a 40 microfarad, 400 working volt capacitor. Well, that thing will hold a charge for quite some time after the power is turned off. And you might think, well, it's unplugged, it'll be perfectly safe to touch everything in it, but you must make sure all capacitors are discharged using a multimeter to verify or shorting across with a pair of pliers or something. It's very important to your safety before you work on it that you take those precautions. So without further ado, I'm going to set this thing up and blast the doors down. a little demonstration of how this works. You can see that a simple computer signal is actually able to then drive the speaker at much higher power than what can ever be produced by the computer. That of course is the point of an amplifier, to take a small signal and boost it to a much larger, more powerful signal. Now this of course is not a complete amplifier. Uh, when I eventually add a pentode or triode preamplifier to it, I'll be able to get better bass response and higher gain. Also, this is a class A amplifier, which is the least efficient, though least distorted also, uh, type of amplifier. I'm considering building a class B push-pull out of it, but because I really enjoy having the high fidelity tube, uh, kind of high fidelity tube circuit working, I might just build a high-powered class A. I'm not as concerned about efficiency with this one as I might be with, say, uh, con an actual commercial DJ or audio product that I would otherwise build or purchase. 
So not particularly efficient, but it does uh, reproduce the sound well, and it's a very simple circuit. Only one valve is controlling this. Now in my final version, of course, all of this is going to be well organized and contained in a nice uh, final product box or package. I'm thinking with the tubes sticking out of the top uh, so that it's a, a lot safer. We don't want anybody to just stick their hand in and get shocked at 260 or 300 volts, which which send you across the room and probably be quite dangerous. So in order to con uh, combat that hazard, it's all going to eventually be inside a wooden or metal chassis. If it is a metal chassis, it'll be grounded. If a uh, wooden chassis, then that won't matter. But it is going to be kept where you can't easily access the hazardous voltages. So that was my very first attempt at building a tube amplifier. I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, I hope you enjoy any future videos on my channel. See you next time.